thousand times. Now that's probably the upper range of this particular speaker. There are smaller, lighter weight speakers that are called tweeters. I don't know where some of the terminology comes from. Bits and bytes and nibbles and tweeters and uh, you asked engineers to names. So I guess, that's right? You asked engineers and, and, and woofers. How many of you have bought woofers for your cars? You could make a bass box. Did you know that mid-range speakers have their own name? That's not very common. They're called squawkers. <laughs> tweeters, squawkers, and woofers. Okay, so it's from the high frequency to the mid frequency down to low frequency range. Okay? And then of course you got subwoofers as well, which are below woofers. But anyway. The point is, all this thing really is is a linear motor that you can push and pull back and forth really, really fast. Now, why would you want to do that? Well, if you push this cone back and forth, what are you pushing on? You're pushing on air, so you're making pressure waves. And these pressure waves move out at the speed of sound and come to our ears, and we can hear it. So basically, it's kind of like connecting. Imagine connect, connecting your eardrum mechanically to the speaker cone and just moving your eardrum back and forth. If you move it back and forth fast enough, you hear sound. That's a really bad idea. Don't try to do this. Okay, that's why when you put earbuds in your ear and you push them in real tight, so that now there's uh, a sealed cavity between the driver, which is actually a little bitty thing like this, and your eardrum. They say don't turn up too loud because it can literally push your eardrum too far. You don't want that. Okay, you want your ear. You want to be able to hear. I think you want to be. I want to be able to hear. So I'm not going to turn up the volume too loud on my speaker set or my headphones either one. Now, why am I showing you all this? Well, this is something you're probably familiar with. Right? You, you probably like music, you listen to music, and you might or might not know how uh, the speaker works. Now it looks like they might, yeah, here we go. There's a nice animation, I haven't seen that before. So here's the two wires coming off the coil. You can see how it's going positive versus negative. So it's kind of like attaching a battery one way and then the other. When you attach the battery in one direction, that causes the speaker coil to move in the inward direction. For example, when you reverse it, it causes it to go in the other direction. And if you apply the voltage where you're going back and forth just right, you'll make sound. You'll make something that can be recognized. I could record my voice, for example. Yeah? So how do you go and make, turn, like, turn up the volume? How do you turn up the volume? You make this go farther. Okay. So you, when it goes, say, positive over here, you make it more positive. Okay? That's how you turn up the volume. So anyway, so that's how these things work. And then, of course, the... the this is really nice, I've got to say this. This is sweet. Somebody did a good job on this. So then the voice coil, which is really the motor part, is connected to the cone and the suspension and just pushes it back and forth. You can see the spider flexing, you can see the, the uh, surround flexing also. Uh, now, how does that work? Well, what that does then is that generates pressure waves, regions in the air that are at high pressure and low pressure, and you can hear it. It, it literally pushes and pulls on your eardrum. This is the reason that when uh, something loud goes off, like uh, an explosion, like uh, from a gun or a uh, you know a dynamite explosion or anything, you really want your ears protected so that that, that pressure wave doesn't come and slam your eardrum too far. Right? It can it can damage your hearing. So how do we how do we record all this? What do, how do we do it? How do we deal with this? Well, you use basically the reverse of a speaker. I've got one right here. It's called a microphone. And basically, it has a little diaphragm that when my voice generates pressure waves in the air, which is all that it really is doing, it will vibrate that diaphragm, which is then hooked to a coil, much like that. Actually, this is probably a condenser microphone, but let's just pretend for now that it's dynamic. If you know the difference, that's great. If you don't, it doesn't matter anyway. Okay? But it will generate a voltage signal that can be measured by the sound card in this computer, recorded as different levels of sound, and replay. That's what this is. This is actually a recording of my voice. I don't know where the recording is anymore. I tried to embed it and that didn't work. And this is, this is actually on my old computer back in Windows XP and this is a program called Cool Edit Pro, which is actually a pretty handy little program. But I've got Audacity. I just had it installed. And let me zoom in just a little bit. If we were to, if we were to zoom in on this section, let me show you what you would see. This is what you would see. And, and further, if we zoomed in on this section, here's what you would see. What are we looking at here? What we're looking at is the way, now imagine that the diaphragm or the speaker is right here. What we're looking at is exactly how the diaphragm moved up and back over time in order to record what my voice was doing. And if I just put this signal out onto a speaker and make the speaker move like this, 
versus time, we will all hear exactly what I said. This is a recording of a voice in particular mind. I'm guessing what you said earlier about it only being able to report out to so many decimal places, that's why people sound different on speakers is because it has to report it in a, an exact number for the code? Not exactly. If you hear well, my I'm voice not. right now, and you hear my voice on a recording, if the audio equipment is high enough quality, you won't be able to tell whether I'm in the room or not if your eyes are shut. The reason that my voice sounds different to me in my head than it sounds to you when it's recorded and when I hear it, I go, oh, that doesn't sound like my voice, is because a, a significant fraction of the sound is transmitted through the bones in my head to my ears and I hear myself. So this, my voice's sound is, is colored by extra sound transmission that you guys don't have because your bones aren't connected to my bones, okay? Obviously, right? The only coupling is through the air to you, okay? Did you know that there are headphones you can buy that actually sit up against your temples and vibrate the bones in your head so you can hear? Which is really cool. I like it because then I can hear other things too if I want to. Anyway, let's keep zooming in on this. If we zoom on in on this little thing right here, this is what we'll see. Now look at this. You see how there's all these little dots? What are these? Well, these points are what are called samples. And what happens, the way that the sound card works is it can't record everything in between, right? It can't record literally every single voltage that this puts out. It has to round it off. And it can't record it continuously. It has to record a number that represents the position of the diaphragm and then wait a little while in time before it grabs the next one. Now that's actually okay. That's not such a big deal because you and my ears can't hear the speaker move really, really fast. There's a certain frequency, like I was saying, that we can't hear. And so if you look at the time scale down here and you start to figure this out, what you'll find is there's not much time in between these samples. Now, not only is the signal discretized in time, it's discretized in level. In other words, there are only certain levels that it can record. It's kind of like steps. Instead of having a continuous ramp, there's only certain steps that the speaker can be at as far as this computer is concerned. Anybody remember CDs? Anybody? Did any of you grow up with CDs? Did anybody have some CDs? I, the last the generation. Generation. I know, this is not going to work very well for people. I think it's like the first generation, generation. generation when iPods were going also, also the ones you can make on custom CDs. cover while have the lights screen. Yeah, yeah. Well, have you ever seen the specification for a CD-ROM? Like, you probably know that it can hold about 70 minutes worth of, of music. Have you ever seen these numbers associated with CDs? 44.1 kilohertz and 16-bit. You ever seen that? Okay, maybe not. If, if you weren't back in the day like me, and apparently you, right? Uh, you probably didn't buy blank CDs in your lifetime. Okay, when, you, when we used to do that, what we buy as a CD and we'd see this all the time. It was an advertising thing. What did it mean? Well, let's think for a minute. If you have two bits, right, two binary digits, how many numbers can you represent? Zero. There's one number. One. That's two numbers. Four bits. Three. That's three numbers. So four different numbers is what you can represent, right? Would it be acceptable to say, okay, I'm going to have a thermostat in my house and I'm going to use a two-bit indication of the temperature I want that will allow me to have a temperature of either, uh, let's see, let's say 65, 70, 75, and 80 degrees. Those are the different temperatures I can accomplish. That's kind of rough, isn't it, right? You'd like a, a little more resolution, something. But, so what if we add another bit? Now we have eight different numbers we can represent, right? Well, now, I don't know where I started. I started at 65. So now we can have 65, 67 and a half. 70, that's a little better, right? But there's still only eight. We'd like probably find a resolution in this. CD-ROMs were six, or CD, audio CD, even CD-ROMs, are 16-bit. What that means is each sample, each measurement of level can be represented by 16 different bits. Grab your calculator or get the one on the computer and take two to the 16th power and tell me what number you get. So 65536. One of the numbers that can be represented is zero, right? Mm -hmm. So if each of these samples or measurements, you could call it, are 16-bit numbers, 
how many different voltages can I represent? Well, 65536, five, one of them being zero, right? So zero to 65535. So the speaker at the center is represented by the halfway point, 32768, okay? So the number of positions on the, the negative side that could be represented for the speaker is 32767, and on the positive side, 32767, and then the middle one is the last number. Does that make sense? I think I did all that right, but it is, it's about. So there's only 32,000 or so different levels that can be represented here, and yet your ears can't hear this. Here's an experiment you can do if you have a CD player still. Be careful with this because you can really hurt your ears doing it, okay? Today's music, it seems like they like to play and the band's going along just fine and all of a sudden they just stop, right? We don't care if we're on the one chord. We don't care if it feels resolved. Just stop the music. We're done, all right? I don't know if you guys noticed that, but that's kind of a, the way a lot of things go. Do you mean like In the, the past, or how people listen? The, the way that artists record their songs, okay? okay? This becomes sort of a style thing. In the past, okay, back in the 80s, right, when I was a kid growing up, almost every song faded out at the end. You guys ever heard a song that fades out at the end? Okay, if you have a CD, an audio CD, and an audio CD player, it's kind of like saying if you have a record player nowadays, okay, if you have one with a song that fades out on the end, do this experiment. Put it on, fast forward it toward the end of that song where it starts to fade out, start turning up the volume as it fades out. Turn it up higher and higher and higher as it fades out farther and farther. Of course, stop it before it gets to the next track and you blow your eardrums out, okay? <laughs> but what you'll notice is that the sound will become very scratchy. Is it? You know what's happening there? Well, in a, a smaller volume just means a smaller waveform. And so if we're representing a smaller waveform that is a recording of the sound, well, if it's from here to here, we don't have as many different steps to it's represent the sound. It would be like with video game graphics if you had If you zoom in bit, farther and farther, yeah, right, exactly. You get closer, it's pixelated, you get more to 8-bit uh, like, looking graphics. It would graphics, be pixelated right? sound, essentially. That's exactly right. It's pixelated sound because you've got fewer numbers to represent the, the singer's voice and the band and whatever they're doing, and it becomes scratchy. As a matter of fact, uh, the Commodore 64 is a computer that I grew up with. The Commodore 64 had a sound chip in it that had three voices. And instead of doing this, where it could record sound by taking samples, the Commodore 64 didn't have near enough memory or anything like that. Okay. Well, it had three voices. You can make square waves, and you can make a noise wave, and you can make a sine wave, and, and make rudimentary music with this. You've probably heard 8-bit music before. Okay. Like on a Super Nintendo. Or is that uh, actually, even the Nintendo. I think uh, the Super Nintendo may have been able to. Oh, okay. I don't know. Super I don't Nintendo know. Nintendo was 16-bit. It is. Was oh. it 16? Well, yeah, 16-bit processor, but not necessarily 16-bit sound. Okay. I don't know. I, anyway, a lot of people have done a lot of hacking with the Commodore 64, made it do things that the original designers would say was utterly amazing, right? And, and impossible. Thank you. One of the things that they've done is they found out that the original audio chip in that computer, which is called the SID chip, sound interface device, I think, had a little voltage leak in it. And what you could do is you could change the, there was a volume set, a master volume set. It was basically four bits. You could put in four bits to this thing and have 16 different volume levels, okay? What they found is that if they varied that volume control, along the waveform, you can make sound with this thing. It was really quiet, but you can make sound. Some games took advantage of this, and I was just blown away as a kid when I, I, don't, I think it was Impossible Mission, when the, the intro graphics were coming, I was playing the music, and all of a sudden, you hear a, a really scratchy, vo but a voice say, stay a while, stay forever, ha ha ha. You know, and I was like, whoa, this thing's talking to me, this is amazing, you know. Anyway, it was only four bit sound, and it was awful, but it was, Really cool at the time, okay? It was very pixelated sound. Anyway, CD-ROMs or CD audio can store 16-bit numbers so we have much finer resolution and can have actually very high quality sound. But I want you to understand that it is still discretized. Do you understand? There's only certain levels or certain positions that can be recorded. You can't record just any position of the, the diaphragm along the way. Now why am I showing you all this stuff about audio? because industrial sensors work essentially the same way. You can't sample a sensor at continuously. You have to sample it at discrete times. So you have to think when you're specifying a sensor and you're deciding 
what you want, you have to decide how often am I going to get a measurement from the sensor. Not only that, but what resolution is appropriate. And if you look over there on those PLCs, <coughs> there we go, PLC files. <coughs> Pardon me. On the extreme right side, you'll notice there's some modules that have a pink label and a module that has a yellow label. You can get up and look at it if you want. It doesn't matter. This is informal. You'll notice on them, in fact, somebody go over there and tell me what you read. It's uh, all the way on the right. It doesn't matter if it's which PLC. One of those two on the top. What do you see? Oh, these up here? Yeah, it's fine. All the way on the right, that yellow label that's horizontal. Yep, what does it say on that yellow label? It's analog out 12 bit. Analog out 12 bit. So that's an analog output module. It's got multiple different screw points there. It probably has eight or so outputs. And it says it's 12 bit. What does that mean that it's 12 bit? They can record a full 4,096. Exactly. So if you take 2 to the 12th power, there's 4,096 different voltage levels that one output point can output. Now, that's not too bad. Let's figure out what that resolution would be. Let's say, no, thank you. I don't know if that card outputs uh, 5 volt or 10 volt signals. Let's just make the math easy. And let's say that that card outputs anywhere from 0 to 10 volts. Maybe it's actually a current output. I don't know. It doesn't matter. Let's say it outputs 0 to 10 volts on one point. If I put a number into the correct register and that number is 0, then it outputs 0 volts. If I put 4,095, into that register, it outputs 10 volts on that point. What's the, the smallest voltage change that I could accomplish? Well, it would be 10 volts, because that's the range, 0 to 10, divided by the range of numbers, 4,096. So what is 10 over 4,096? Uh, 0.0024 dot dot dot. Okay. 0.002, so 2 millivolts. That's the, that's the resolution. So I could output 2 millivolts and then 4 millivolts, but I can't output 3 millivolts, can I? Of course, I'm rounding off. Let's just say it was 2 millivolts to make it easy, okay? So 2 millivolts, 4, 6, 8, and I have to be happy with that. That's the best I can do, you see. So is that okay? I don't know. It depends on the process. Most processes, yeah, that's probably just fine resolution. But you notice that's 12-bit. That's not even 16-bit resolution. A lot of cards deal with 10-bit re resolution. Now let's find out. I don't remember. We had the uh, data up on the uh, Click Coyos a minute ago, and they had resolution in there. I told you we get to it while we're, we're to it. It, it. I thought it did say 12-bit. Where is it? Right there, 12-bit. So it's the same as those, right? So what does that mean for the, uh, let's see, where is the output section? What does that mean for the output section? Well, let's just say that we're outputting 0 to 5 volts at 12-bit resolution. What's the smallest voltage increase that we can output? So let's say we're at 0 volts, and we output a number of 1 instead of 0. Okay? What would that 1 translate into? In other words, take 5 volts and divide it by 4096. What do you get? one millivolt or so. So do you see how this works? We can go anywhere from zero to five volts in approximately one millivolt steps. We can't output a half a millivolt because it simply doesn't have that resolution. What have I just done here? I'm going to swing the camera around for this because I think this is worth saying. Let me show you the equation for resolution so this will make sense. So I don't know what the register actually is in the PLC. Uh, we can figure it out. We'll figure it out in the software a little bit later. But let's just say that it's a, uh, what do they call those? It's not a DF. Those are floats. I can't It's a D something, but I can't remember. I think it's a DS if I remember it, like a DS1 or something. Okay. If the number we put into this register is zero, then what do we get out as far as voltage on output one? So if we measure the voltage at DA1V, how much voltage would we see? Well, we'd see zero volts. So this is the count, or number, or whatever you want to call it. If I output 4,095, which is the biggest number I could output because it's 12-bit, um, 
put that into ds1, then da1v is going to output a 5 volt signal. It's pretty easy. Can you tell me what number I should put in here to ds1 in order to get a 2.5 volt signal output? Anybody want to guess? What is it? Just halfway, isn't it? 2048 or 2047, doesn't matter. 2047.5. Well, we can't, right? We can't output 2047.5. So let's just say 2488. And this will be about really close. It might be off by a millivolt or so, but that's close enough, right? What if I put out one? What if that's the count that I'm putting into DS1? What voltage would I get out? How would you figure it out? That's the resolution, right? That, because each count going up to two, going up to three, and so on and so forth, would increase by however much it takes so that once I get to 4095, I'm outputting five volts. So the way you calculate resolution is the variable on top, so voltage, with the variable range, Here, let's, let's do it this way. It's variable range divided by 2 to the power of um, the uh, resolution, uh, not the resolution, but in our case it's also called resolution. How many bytes it has? To, to 12. How many bits it has? It's 12 bit. Okay. So you already know that that number is 4095, well 4096. Because really, it's, it's 4095 to 0. It's also a range. Okay. So if you do this, this is going to be 5 volts minus 0 volts divided by 4096. And what does that come up to again? Somebody did it earlier. It's, it was about a millivolt. Zero, zero, zero. But how much is it? 0 0.001 what? 2. 2. 2. two, two. two. Okay. But close enough. So this is, this is what we would see. No, well, that's actually in volts in still in volts because we have that. Level. So what we would see if we did this is 0 0.00122 volts. If you output 2, what do you get? Twice that, right? It's just another count. It's an increment account. These counts actually have a name. They're called least significant bits. Why are they called that? Well, let me make a fairly low resolution number. I'm going to use, let's see, I'll do it in the same order. Let's say instead of having 12 bit, all we have is 4 bit. That way it doesn't take me forever to write these down. It's already taken a long time, even with this number of bits. And you understand where I'm going now. I'm just counting them binary, right? What's happening? Well, this number is 1, or is 0. This number is 1, this number is 2, this number is 3, and so on. What am I really doing? Aren't I just counting up by one sig least significant bit? I'm just incrementing that position, right? So these are least significant bit counts. Because it's how many times the least significant bit has been flipped, in other words, to get to the next number. So when you do this calculation, your, un your units are usually, say, voltage or current or whatever your, your variable is, per least significant bit. So the, the resolution here is volts per least significant bit transition. Does that, does that make sense? Because when I count up, it doesn't matter if I count from here to here or, or from here to here or, or where I'm going, the amount of increase will always be this resolution. Okay? Does that make sense? Okay. All right. Uh, let's see. Let's go back to the slides. Let's do something fun. I showed you speakers and then I jumped back into resolution. Why don't we use Audacity? Who wants to have their voice recorded? Anybody want to volunteer? <laughs> I see several people volunteering other people. That's fine. If you wish. We'll have some fun with this. Okay. <laughs> okay, I'm going to hit record and everybody else be quiet. Recording in session. You ready? All right. Go ahead.
Hi, my name's Tristan. Great. Thank you. Probably should have come up with something to say before I went up. <laughs> now, this is what the microphone was doing. Let's zoom in on it so we can actually see it. Now, unfortunately, we've got a fairly low signal level. It's not his fault. Probably somewhere there's a volume control I need to turn on. Yeah, right here. Let's try that again because this is a pretty small signal. Now, you can still see that there's a signal there, right? So let's just record again and let's see what we get. Try again. Braden's ramen noodle shirt suits him very well. <laughs> <laughs> and I still don't have a very good signal though. Uh, what did that do wrong? We'll record it. Well, we'll just play it. You should be able to hear it. Let's see. We may just have to turn it up a little bit. It's like it's like way louder than it seems. It just blares that. Okay, so let's play it and see what we got. I want to play. Oh, I probably need to. Uh, tell them what to play. Oh. Maybe I tell them to play this. Come on. What's wrong? We're gonna have some fun with this. And it's Facebook. Our audio is. Maybe. Is there a pause? No, let's see. Well, now it's going. <laughs> At least it's going, huh? <laughs> Try getting a stop then. Maybe we'll start from the beginning. Okay, let's try that. Brains ramen noodle shirt suits him very well. You guys hear that okay? Yeah. Brains ramen noodle. Now. Look at this. Check this out. <laughs> so you heard his voice. You heard exactly what he said. Check this out. It's a little bit different, but Listen, listen to this. Brain, 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 brain. That waveform is, is what his voice is doing to the air, the way it's pushing and pulling the air to say break for the brain word, right? If we zoom in on this, it just looks like a bunch of noise, right? But when we make a speaker push and pull in accordance with this particular motion, where it follows that motion, you and I hear break. 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 You can even see how the sound varies over the length of the sound, right? And if you think of break, right, that sound is it's, it's evolving as you make it, right? It's changing from here over here, and you can see it, which I think is really just amazing. Now if we zoom out a little bit, let's see if we can find Brayden. Where do you think Brayden? Where do you think Den goes to? Tell me when to stop. Right there? Let's find out. Brains. Brains. You see how Brayden's all ran together? Okay. Let's try this. Brains. Brains. Do you know what do you notice about this little section right here? It's, 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 that's the s, isn't it? How do you know that? Well, you see how tight it is. Here, let me zoom in on it. Yeah, because that makes sense too, because it's a consistent sound, so it would follow a sound wave. That that is true, but what's really interesting here is that there's a lot more what's called high frequency content, a lot more moving back and forth quicker. Okay, that's what s's do. They're they're higher frequency sounds. A snare drum hit, for example, is a higher frequency sound in its, its fundamental components rather than, say, a bass drum or even a piano. Okay? The high end of the piano causes vibrations that are faster, not necessarily louder, but faster than the low end of the piano. Okay? I wish this was a bigger signal because it's, it's neater when you can see more variation, but, but this is fine. This will work. What other word have we got here? <laughs> ramen noodle. Ramen noodle. Ramen noodle. Ramen noodle. You hear that? Ramen noodle. So here's the ramen. Ra men nu. So there's the men. Ramen. 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 The ramen. Now let's really zoom in on the, the ramen, the ra, ra sound. When we zoom in, 
we finally get to a point where it goes to sample. You see the shape. We zoom in just a little bit more. Now it's finally showing us here are the individual discrete points that represent the position of that microphone at that particular time. So let's zoom in just a little more. And you can see the individual samples and what their levels were and how their levels varied with time. You see? Now, like I said, I'm showing you all this because any system is going to work the same way. Your, your PLC will discretize in time based on the scan cycle, right? Because every scan, it goes out and grabs all the input. So it's going to